Leslie. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Cindy. That really was a great sort of framework as we think about this on an implementation level. Um, Michael asked that I share with you all why this is so much of a civil rights issue and why it's such an equity focus. And, and that is actually a hard question for me to answer because this is so in at least my DNA as being a civil rights issue. <laughs> Starting with the data, I uh, live and work in California, and there we're looking at uh, college preparatory graduation rates that tell a really sad story. For example, only about 13% of Latino students in the state will graduate on time, having met these course requirements for college preparatory. Uh, only about 15% of African American students compare that to about 55% of Asian graduates and about 34% of white graduates. So two things stand out in those numbers for me. One, that certainly there's a big access gap to these courses, but also that we're not doing very well by any group of kids here. When we share with uh, policymakers in California that only about 34% of white students get this curriculum, they are shocked, right? Because their perceived expectation is so much higher. When we first, we too, opened our doors in 2001, like Achieve uh, in California at Trust West, and when we first began really trying to study and understand the California landscape, all these fantastic policy makers and really smart people said, we're doing this, we've got this equity thing down. There's this magnificent omnibus legislation moving through the halls of Sacramento. It's gonna get passed, it was called the Unrealized Learner Bill. Hmm. So one to better understand what they meant by Unrealized Learner. Turns out in that bill, they had nothing about course access. They had nothing about um, moving graduation rates up. They had nothing about college entry or success. It was really about self-esteem. It was about life skills. It was about providing communication skills to students and courses like ethics and like um, preparing for life and preparing for life after high school. And I remember talking to the senator who wrote that bill saying, well, if they can't have the tools that prepare them, what does self-esteem do for them? In other words, make me get how a course called self-esteem actually helps prepare students for life after high school, when in a minute they will be barred, not only from our states, you see uh, the University of California that had long since had these, these heightened graduation requirements, but even our California State University system that was now gonna be requiring these, what they call in California, the A to G curriculum, essentially 15 courses of college prep coursework. And it was met with a real big shock and a real big question mark, mostly because policymakers thought that we were providing these courses to kids in the first place. So we began working on the state level and then drew, drove it down into the local levels, because you can imagine at the state level we heard all sorts of things about how kids would drop out, there's no way you could raise these requirements and have them catch up, that you would water down the curriculum, that in other words, if we stretched kids, or their teachers very far, the entire system would fall apart as if it hadn't already. Um, and then I remember a young woman named Leticia Panaco out of LA, and she said, Russell, she told us, and the only time, she said, Russell, they don't want me to go to college. They want me to do manicures for the people that are going to college. My heart broke with that, as I can imagine yours might too. Then we looked at her course catalog and realized that her LA high school, she was offered nine courses of cosmetology, ranging from manicuring one to manicuring four, all the way up to uh, 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 hair and, and learning how to run a business, though there was no accounting in it. And we realized that she was actually very right. Or Gabriella Perez, who told us that um, they taught her how to fill out a McDonald's application in her life skills course. So then we began really unpacking this access question and realizing that across the board, as Achieve had, is also documented, that in the schools that were most impacted, that were most African American, that were most Latino and mostly poor, these courses weren't offered to them in the first place. And I could go on for a lot, a lot more than 10 minutes about what they're getting in their stead. I could show you assignments from courses called Algebra Art. 
I could show you assignments from courses like career planning that not once look at even the requirements for apprenticeship programs. Because the truth is, when we say, when a chief says, ready for career and ready for work, they really do mean the same thing now. In order to be ready to access post-secondary education in a, in a formal through the colleges and university sense, you also need those same skills um, to move into the world of career and work. In other words, what is uh, cosmetology if it's not chemistry? What is construction if it's not geometry? And the new demands of apprenticeship programs really require much higher level skills than ever before in order to get in. For example, to any good construction apprenticeship program in California, students need to demonstrate capacity in both in plain geometry. Um, that even in culinary arts, because that's the new thing, the only new money coming down the pike in California is what they call Proposition 1T, 1D, it's all for this career tech ed. And as we're hearing anecdotally, everybody's going into it, grabbing those culinary arts dollars for these culinary art facilities. They're not training folks to be sous chefs, I assure you, they're training them to flip hamburgers. But when you look at the requirements of the Culinary Arts Institute, boy, are they far more rigorous than folks ever imagined. And so. For us, it really was about access and to hear the community demanding it. As Michael talked about step up, I could share with you. I wouldn't want, I couldn't do justice to the student stories in just the few minutes that I have left. But to see 800 and 1,000 parents marching at LAUSD saying, "Si se puede, let me choose my future." We're, we're witnessing a different kind of organizing around this movement. One that doesn't just say to the system, you've screwed me so much, so don't expect much from me, but to the contrary, saying that uh, let me get access to the rigor so that I can create a pathway. Because we heard from so many young people, valedictorians of their high schools, that couldn't even apply to the state's four-year colleges simply because they hadn't had the courses required for admission. So this notion of college prep really is an organized tool, not just about the community, um, but also about organizing the way high schools work. We set stretch goals and every level of the system, from elementary to middle and on up, has to fix themselves and transform themselves to, to make sure that students are ready to access the next level. It's also an organizing tool to get at what we know makes schools work better and to close those opportunity gaps that give rise to the achievement gap. You can't talk about students getting access to Algebra 2 without both making sure that those courses actually teach Algebra 2 and that the instructors in front of the classroom are equipped to teach it to students, mostly that are coming in far behind. Last Lastly, I will leave you with this. It's not just about those standards. California has had really high standards for a long time. We're realizing now it's not just about access to the courses, but really the content therein. I could tell you stories about assignments for students that are in the same, the same courses, U.S. College Prep History, with the exact same textbook studying the exact same topic, the Depression. One in a district serving mostly white kids, almost no core and very few students of color. The other serving mostly uh, Latino, African American, and some core, not so many poor, but some poor students. And the black and brown kids are reading these passages and role playing Meet the Press. They're listening to jazz to try and get a handle on the depression and the white and Asian kids were doing an assignment that asked them to study Hoover's rugged individualism and talk about agriculture and consumer spending and debt. So when students bring home A's in the courses where their college prep history and their role playing meet the press and listening to jazz, what are parents to do? They will likely get in to the four years but be right where Sandy indicated and that's not ready for college level coursework, taking remedial classes for which they're not earning credit for and spending loads of money. Until we can close the wage, the credential gap, we're not going to close the wage gap either. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosalind. I'd like to at some point hear more about that algebra art class. <laughs> <laughs>